Hey, gorgeous. Welcome to the Business Mindset Podcast with Holly Wharton, which combines powerful strategies on how to upgrade your business mindset, along with practical business tips to grow your business. This podcast features solo shows with Holly and also interviews with inspiring women entrepreneurs from around the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. And now, here's your host, Holly Wharton. Hello and welcome to the Business Mindset Podcast, episode 167. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm here with today's special guest, Jessica Nazarali. Jessica is the host and founder of the It Girl Academy and the It Girl Foundation. She's a speaker, leading coach, and mentor dedicated to helping women create meaningful global careers and live out their best lives. Welcome, Jessica. Hi, Holly. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I am super excited to be talking to you today. <laughs> so why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your background and your business journey and how you got to where you are today with your business? Great question. So when I was about 21 years old, I was uh, working as a nanny. And I had a lot of kind of random jobs in high school and when I was at university. But the nannying job really changed a lot for me. And the reason being was I was working for two families. And one family, the woman was an entrepreneur. She had her own business. And the other family, the mother worked full time in a full time job. Mm -hmm. And to kind of make it even, I guess, even more challenging, they're both um, single mom, like single oh, parents. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was no fathers involved. So, and I really saw the mom who had the most freedom and just seemed to enjoy her life the most was the mom who had her own business. Mm -hmm. You know, she was definitely working a lot. However, she was still, you know, she was able to be there for her kids and she had that freedom and flexibility. And so I saw that and decided that, okay, I was going to have my own business. I didn't know what it was going to be or how I was going to do it. But I knew that, you know, one day when I had children, there was no way I was going to, you know, be navigating work, children, and having to leave the home at a ridiculous time, even though I know a lot of workplaces have got better with flexibility. So I started a blog when I was about, when I was 23 years old, and I didn't know how the blog was going to, going to turn into a business, but I, I was smart enough to realize if I had a following around a certain area that I would be able to monetize it. Mm -hmm. And for about 18 months, I was blogging five days a week. It was a blog on health and wellness, and I built up a big following. I was invited to events and I was doing sponsored posts. And it did turn into a business, but kind of not from the way that I thought it would be. People started coming to me, other naturopaths, nutritionists, dietitians, and said, oh, wow, you know, you've built up, you know, you know, a large following on Facebook. You know, you're getting, you know, all these comments on your blog. Can you help me do this? Because I want to, you know, use the internet and use blogging as a way to find clients in my nutrition practice. So I started blog coaching and that was kind of really how my business started. And it wasn't necessarily, like I said, it wasn't planned to go mm. that way, but it was just really a matter of listening to what my readers wanted. So I started blog coaching and then over time it's kind of evolved to what I do today. Excellent. So what do you think was the kind of the biggest factor in building that community and that big following around your blog? Because lots of people blog for years and mm. never managed to get to that point. Totally. Well, I think it was consistency. So I was blogging, you know, once a day and just developing really good content. So, you know, content with beautiful images, content that was different. You know, a, a good tip that, you know, I still use today is you can, you know, you see what's kind of trending Mm -hmm. in terms of maybe popular culture, and then you, you know, put your own spin on it in relation to, you know, whatever your chosen topic is. Or you look at, okay, well, what are the most popular articles, say, in the, in the health space or like, or in, you know, when it comes to business? And then you use, it's called a method of a skyscraper model where it's, okay, so you look at that and then you create your own version of that post. Because, you know, I don't know, everyone's interested in chia seeds. So, you know, you create your version of a chia seed post or whatever it may be. And it's, you know, partnering with people as well. So, you know, guest posting, joint ventures, and just really not giving up. I think consistency is huge, you know, blogging once a week and expecting to get, get a huge following isn't necessarily going to happen. It's, you know, just being that consistent and uh, being dedicated to producing great content. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you had a real strategy behind that. It wasn't just writing stuff that maybe sounded fun and interesting to you. It was, it was really focusing on what were kind of the big topics that people were searching for in the health industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
And was it, we, did you start this blog just because this was a topic that was passionate for you, that you were passionate mm. about, you were interested in, you felt like you had a lot to say on the topic, you wanted to contribute your voice to that field? How did that yeah. start? Basically, that's why. Um, I've always been really passionate about health and wellness, so that that ultimately was the reason why. And I was working in a job that I didn't particularly – I mean, it was okay, but I, I wasn't feeling like I was – able to really make a difference on a day-to-day basis. And I, I've been reading a lot of blogs and I thought, well, I could do that. And so I, I did essentially. And it was, you know, like I said, in the beginning, it really was just a hobby. It was a passion project. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would eventually turn into a business. And, you know, then I started to get sponsored posts and, you know, having advertisers on the blog. And then, you know, I created an ebook and I was doing some affiliate marketing and then I got into coaching. So you know, it did turn into a business, but I think, you know, what really spurred me to keep on going in the beginning was, was because it was a passion project. And it, I just really enjoyed having something to do, to do outside of work that felt like, I don't know, I was contributing in some small way to, you know, the betterment of the world. <laughs> or, um, you know, when you're working in a job, sometimes something as small as, you know, writing a post that you're really proud of can, can really make your day when you're, mm. You're not loving what you're doing nine to five. Yeah, yeah, because you've got that hobby that's helping people in addition to just making your day better. Exactly, exactly. So, and how did what did that blog evolve into? So now you've got this business where you're coaching, you're a business coach. What uh-huh. happened to that health blog? Right, the health blog, I it's still there. So the health blog is, yeah, I still have it. But my main focus at the moment is on Jessica Nazarali, mm-hmm. which is and the It Girl Academy, which is my um, online academy where I sell courses in the range of you know mindset, business, and then a, a coaching certification program. So I made that transition and created a website under my own name once I realized that what I was doing was. I guess, becoming more than just health and wellness. And it was going into, you know, coaching and consulting. So I started the first package I ever released was a blog coaching package. So I was working with people on how to essentially create a blog and how to get followers and traffic and engagement around their blog. Mm -hmm. So that's what I first started doing. And then as I had success in that area, it grew more than just blogging. So then Mm -hmm. it was, you know, how to create sales funnels and Facebook advertising and webinars and I guess more advanced online marketing strategies as I was growing as well. Mm-hmm. All right. And you were building all this as you had your corporate job. So at what point did you realize that it was time to leave that corporate job and go full on into your business? Yeah, great question. So it had it was when I'd been coaching for about seven months part-time. So I was in the beginning, I was working full-time in my job. And then as I started to get clients, I negotiated with my work to go part-time. So I had every Friday off. Then eventually it was every Friday and every second Thursday. And then, you know, right towards the end, I was only working three days a week. Mm -hmm. So there was a period of time when I was for seven months, I was coaching and working in my day job. And so at the end, you know, at the six month mark, I was like, look, you know, I've, I've proven to myself that I was making, you know, anywhere between like $3,000 and $7,000 a month in my business. And that was only working, well, you know, weekends and nights and those, <laughs> you know, Friday and every second Thursday when, when I got to that stage. And so I realized I was like, wow, you know, if I had more time to get, dedicate to this, I would probably have more clients and, you know, things would be taking off quicker. So then I, you know, resigned and my last day of work was on the 28th of February in 2014. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was an exciting day. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) And how have things grown since then, since you were able to dedicate yourself full time to your business? What impact did that have? Yes, great question. Well, the first month, it was, yeah, it was challenging in a lot of ways. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, it's just me and it's, I'm at home and there's no work colleagues around me. So I found the first month just, you know, a a lot of learnings. But after that, you know, it definitely got easier and I worked out a schedule and I, you know, really, I guess, discovered what worked for me in terms of, you know, working from home. Mm -hmm. Since then, you know, a lot of things, I guess, have changed and transformed. 
you know, now I have a number of different ways that I work with clients. I do one-on-one coaching. I also have, you know, a mindset program where I, I work with people on how to develop to build personal mastery and to just really believe in themselves because I find that so many women, the reason they don't start a business or they don't, you know, leave that job is because they're really scared. Mm -hmm. So we have created a program to really help women around that. I have an online course on um, business mastery, which I've just relaunched, which is going super well. And I'm planning on launching a coaching certification program at the end of the year. Mm. Yeah, which I'm super excited for. But I guess my biggest, I suppose, financial achievement was in 2015. My business did, it was like just over $600,000 in revenue. So that was pretty cool considering it hadn't been going full time. It was my second year full time in business. Mm. So Excellent. So what would you say are your top tips on how to go from zero to 600,000 in business revenue? in such a short period of time? Yeah, great question. My biggest tips, well, number one, you know, get really clear on what it is that you're doing and what what business you're in and what you're selling. Mm -hmm. Because I see all the time, you know, people can be a little bit, you know, this week they're a such and such coach or this week, you know, they're, they're selling this service. And it's like, come up with your flagship offer or product and, you know, really focus on doing that well. And then once that's doing well, it's like, you know, roll out into other areas, you know, create different products. So I would say, you know, number one, get really clear on what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Consistency really is key. So consistent marketing equates to consistent profits. And, you know, you don't need to be the one always doing the marketing yourself. You know, as you get bigger, you'll be able to, you know, maybe hire a social media manager or, you know, get support in some areas. But in the beginning, you know, it really was just me. So I was writing the emails, putting the emails in the email marketing platform, you know, writing the blogs. So having a consistent plan to actually market your business, that's, you know, really necessary as well. And, you know, finally, just like monitor your numbers, you know, Mm -hmm. know how much money you're making each month, know what your expenses are, you know, how much you're paying your team. You know, and that was a big learning for me when I was starting out as well, because I remember I was tracking like very closely how much I was making, mm-hmm. but I wasn't really tracking my expenses. Mm. <laughs> and then so I remember in the beginning, I was like, okay, well, I've made this, but you know, that's the thing as well. Like you, it's not like you're getting a salary anymore where like, that's literally just going in your back pocket. Like when mm-hmm. you have a business, it's like, as everyone knows who's listening, like you, you have expenses. So really staying on top of those and just looking out for, you know, what's necessary, what's maybe a bit of a luxury and you could cut back on. Yeah, I think that is um, critical, Mm. especially when you're starting out, but really at any time throughout your business. Yeah. Now you mentioned having a support team. Who was the first person or role that you hired to help you with your business? Uh, So the first person I hired was a virtual assistant for two hours a month. Because I was, at the time, I was still working my job and it was when I had my blog. So I was only making, oh gosh, maybe, you know, a hundred or two hundred dollars a month, like in the early days, it mm-hmm. wasn't all that much, but I knew I needed somebody kind of on hand in case something came up when I was working because I was working, you know, mm-hmm. Monday to Friday. So I had a virtual assistant who would do things like help with like scheduling newsletters you know, like responding to like uh, people who emailed in and were asking questions, kind of general customer support. And in the beginning, it was two hours a month. And then it expanded as I felt more confident to pay her more. (laughs) And now what kind of team do you have supporting you now that you're making 600k in business? Uh, It's pretty small, to be honest. So uh, my husband has come on board to he helps gosh I'll talk about him last actually because it's really (laughs) easier him and me do a lot of different things it's kind of hard to to put a title on us I guess you could say so I have a customer success person Mm -hmm. who you know deals with all the customer service I have a marketing manager marketing slash launch manager who does things like Facebook advertising you know monitoring like the sales funnels which are going out making sure that you know we're you know, do we need to change the email subject line? Like this ad isn't converting as well as it could be. I have like a graphic, someone who does graphics, that's, you know, on a very part-time basis, like mm-hmm. as and when is needed. And then there's my husband, Faze, who does things like joint ventures, like collaboration when it comes to those and just 
gosh, what does he do? <laughs> kind of the, the bigger, you know, I guess we collaborate together on a lot of like, you know, the direction of the business and where it's going. Mm-hmm. He negotiates and yeah, I don't know. Gosh, what does he do? He does a lot of things. <laughs> Both of us, he came on recently to really, you know, deal with the, the areas that As your business grows, you know, it was just some of the specific tasks that I wasn't necessarily, um, didn't necessarily enjoy doing. Like when there's, I don't know, an issue with a contractor, you know, maybe a team member isn't performing as well as they should. He kind of comes in as an escalation point, which is cool to have that. Mm, Excellent. So you have kind of a location independent business, don't you? Because you spend half the year in the Southern Hemisphere and half the year in the Northern Hemisphere. Are you still doing that? We are at the moment, probably not next year, just Mm. because, yeah, we're going to have some, you know, family things that will be keeping us in Australia more Mm -hmm. often than not. But we're about to go to the US next week, actually. We're in Australia at the moment. Mm. So we'll be in the US and Canada until the end of the year. Yeah. Sorry, how is that running your business from different points around the world? Do you kind of stop and stay in one place for a while or are you constantly traveling when you're outside of Australia? We try to stay in places for a longer period of time. So, for example, we're going to San Diego for about two and a half weeks. Then after that, going to LA for a couple of weeks. So the key is not to, people always ask me, how do you do it? It's like you don't go to a place for like three days. Yeah. (laughs) You know, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Because then it's like you just get to the hotel and you're leaving again. And as well as, you know, when you're in a place for a shorter period of time, you feel like you want to actually see the place, right? So then you do no work. <laughs> I'm only here for three days. I need to experience wherever we are. So that's how we do it. And because we're at places for, you know, minimum of two weeks, mm-hmm. yeah, it's fine. I mean, something that I think has worked in my favor is now I'm really able to, I don't know necessarily whether it's a good thing or not, but I guess work in a bit of chaos. You know, I don't like, some people will be like, oh, to work, I need it to be really peaceful and you know, I need to have my crystal here and my green. It's like, no. And I think it's a positive to be able to, you know, just get on and do things despite the circumstances. Oh, it allows you to Um, be more flexible and just get stuff done and not have those excuses. Because, I mean, I've got my home office with a door that I can shut and no one bothers me. Like, I have that peaceful environment and I love it and it helps me work. But sometimes that can be an excuse as well. I mean, if you are out and about somewhere and you do need to get work done and you can't because you're not in your special office place, (laughs) that can Mm -hmm. transform into, you know, not a very good thing for your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's been fun. I mean, I don't think it's going to be like this, you know, forever. And so I think that's why we've been able to embrace it as well. Because it's like, okay, this is just going to be a period of time in our lives. And then, you know, moving forward, we'll see how it changes. Yeah. Good. The important thing is that you've got that skill now. So you know that if you ever do want to kind of pick up and run your business from wherever, you can do that. Mm-hmm. Because I think mm-hmm. other people might have some fears around their ability to run their business from outside of their normal office environment. Yeah, it's funny. I, I hear like that a lot of people, like, they, like I tell them what I do and they're like, oh my gosh, like I could never do that. It's like, well, you probably could if you know, you had to. Yeah. <laughs> or if you gave yeah. it a try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you and if you really wanted to. Do. I yeah. think some people it's funny, like I'll have a lot of clients say to me, it's like, Oh, you know, I want to be able to quit my job so I can go travelling and then they will quit their job and they'll go, you know, on a three week holiday, which is totally fine. Like I'm mm. not dissing it. But it's you know, I think sometimes in people's minds I can glamorize, oh, you know, I could totally be able to go away for like three or six months. And then when push comes to shove, it's like, actually, you know, I'm good being wherever I live mm. and then, you know, taking more holidays. Yeah. So I, I think it just depends on, it depends on your personality and it depends on what you want to do. Yeah, definitely. Everyone is definitely different on that part. So Jessica, do you have any women business mentors? Are there any women entrepreneurs who inspire you? Great question. I love Sophia Amoruso. Mm-hmm. The founder of Girl Boss and what well, sorry, the author of Girl Boss and the founder of Nasty Gal. Mm-hmm. I just think she's so cool. I have a bit of a girl crush on her. Yeah, I just love what she's done and how she her marketing, like if you follow I guess her on Instagram or you listen to her podcast. I think it's just interesting how she's always 
act like not so I guess subtly promoting what she's doing like it's not really in your face but mm-hmm. it's always like very clear what she does you know who and who is it for so I love Sophia and then I look up to other people like Marie Folio mm-hmm. I love you know her interviewing skills have just gotten incredible from you know doing Marie TV for so long and yeah I, I just think she's really amazing so she's somebody else I look up to Mm, excellent. So you've talked a little bit about how, different ways that you work with people. What is the best way for our listeners to check you out and maybe think about working with you? Mm, sure. So you can go to my website's my name. So it's uh, jessicanazarali.com. Um, and I also have a couple of links or, or gifts that we can share as well. I have um, an amazing audio which is like morning meditation but it's not really meditation it's kind of like a visualization to Mm -hmm. house which is quite cool yeah it's gotten like a great response because I think sometimes like I meditate I've just kind of started you know being quite stricter with my practice but I think you know sometimes you just want I don't know like a motivational music and like words to really uplift you in the morning so if you go to itgirlaudio.com you'll be able to um download that audio for free Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. And where else can people find you online in addition to your website? Uh, Yeah, you can find me on Facebook. So that's Jessica Nazarali. If you just type that into Facebook and Instagram is Jess Nazarali and uh, Snapchat is Jess Nazarali as well. And how are you finding Snapchat for business? (laughs) Great question. Oh, I don't, I find it honestly. I'm using it more for fun. Mm-hmm. So my strategy and what I think is, I have it on my Instagram. So I'm quite. I love Instagram, and I'm really committed to growing that. So I find people who follow me on Instagram because I then post about Snapchat once in a while. They'll then follow me on Snapchat. So I think it helps people who already follow me to probably learn more about me Ooh, I like and that. to build like that you no know, like and trust factor. But am I, you know? I guess, strategically growing the platform. Not really. I mean, my main focus is on social media or Facebook and Instagram. But yeah, Snapchat's kind of fun. Do you use that, Holly? <laughs> no, I haven't used it yet. I got the app and I just, you know, sitting there and I, <laughs> not even. The thing is, I'm so active on other social media channels and I just feel like, oh, another thing. Yeah, so, I know. So, yeah. But I do love Instagram. So, oh my gosh, yeah. so much fun, so much so fun. Much fun. <laughs> so my last question for you today before we sign off is, one of the things that you'd mentioned that you work with people on is how to sign your first client in 30 days, even if you mm-hmm. have no list or following. And yeah. according to you, that comes down a lot to mindset. So can we talk a little bit about that before we sign off? Of course. So, you know, number one, you need to first believe that you can sign clients and can work with clients. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a new client the other day and she was just kind of having a bit of a moment. And I said, we'll call her Sarah. I said, Sarah, you do realize, you know, to hit your goal, you need to sign two clients. Like there's two clients out of everyone in the whole entire world who needs to work on the area that you offer support in. And so I think when, you know, first of all, like you really need to believe that it's possible. So you know, think about like wherever you're living right now, there's probably two pity people in your city or town that fall into that category, let alone, you know, everyone in the whole entire world. So number one, you know, break down how many clients you want to be signing or, you know, by what date you want to sign a client by and, you know, believe that it is possible. You know, number two, you need to be really clear on what it is that you're offering. So people pay for a result and an outcome They don't pay to talk to Jane once a week for 60 minutes because (laughs) if that's kind of the way you're positioning coaching, it's like, oh, well, you're basically a paid friend and people don't pay their friends to talk to them. No. So (laughs) it needs to be like very specific what problem you're helping people solve. And by the outcome or by the end of the one month, three months or six weeks, however long the package is, what is it they're going to get? So once you you have the package, then it's about going out there and, you know, getting somebody on the phone for a discovery session. So if you want to sign a client within the next four weeks, um, doing a lot of actual, you know, in-person outreach or individual outreach is going to be really beneficial. Of course, you know, doing things like setting up an opt-in, writing an email funnel, 
you know, then running Facebook ads, the opt-in or lead magnet, you know, that's great. And, you know, I definitely recommend that you do that. If you just do all that, you may not necessarily find a client in a month because it's like, mm. well, you got to write the, you got to create the opt-in, you got to do the lead magnet, Facebook ads. The first time anyone ever runs a Facebook ad, <laughs> it's always a bit of a nightmare. Learning process. So, yeah, exactly. So then you're probably kind of at the end of a month and you're like, well, I haven't got a client yet. So I would start doing all of that, but then do individual outreach. Hmm. So, you know, who do you know in your current networks that you that could be interested in coaching. Can you put on, can you host a meetup event? So like create an event and put it on meetup or Eventbrite, you know, it could be a free event Mm -hmm. or it could just be like a $10 event. But basically you talk for an hour, a little bit like say a webinar, you talk for an hour, give free content, and then you offer discovery sessions at the end. You know, can you, by doing things like live streaming on Facebook, or if you already have like social media channels, you know, and people are engaging on there, you know, you can reach out to them privately and be like, hey, Sarah, you know, I can see, you know, been commenting on my posts about, you know, losing five pounds before the end of summer. You know, I would be curious to know, you know, what support you'd like in this area. I would love to offer you a complimentary assessment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, offering people assessments in your chosen area. So people who you know, you feel could be a good fit for your coaching package can be a great way to get them on the phone. And then an assessment, you can offer, you know, some free advice and tips. It's like you're giving a little bit more than you would in a regular discovery session. Hmm. So they've got something to walk away with. But then you at the end, you can say, would you consider, you know, working with a coach in this area? And then just having a conversation from there. So doing a lot of outreach, if you're looking to get a client, And, you know, just monitoring your actions every day. Mm. You know, is this going to get you one step closer to getting a client? If it is, you know, go and do it. But doing things like working on your logo or, um, (laughs) you know, like that, you know, the design of your website, like that's not going to help you necessarily get a client right away. So just making sure the tasks you're doing are a high leverage. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think when we're starting out in business, it can be so tempting to work on our website or work on our logo or work on <laughs> our next blog post because that's the easy stuff. You don't have to get out there mm-hmm. and get in touch with people and speak to human beings and put yourself yeah. out there. So it can be so tempting in the beginning to focus on the safe stuff rather than the stuff that's actually going to get you the clients, which is the big scary mm-hmm. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing. Nobody really wants to do that. And Everyone loves the idea of, you know, (laughs) it it would be nice if I said, oh, yeah, all you have to do to sign a client is write a blog post and (laughs) share the blog post on your Facebook page and then wait for people people to come to you. And it's like, well, you know, the process of having a lead magnet and writing a sales funnel, like that will mean people do come to you Mm -hmm. because, you know, you'll have a call to action in the email funnel saying, you know, click here to book in for a discovery session. You'll then get the link and then you have the call. But yeah, that just that process will take some time to set up. So it just really depends on, you know, how urgent you really are to get a client. Mm, Excellent. Thank you so much. I think that's really practical advice and sound advice that I think sometimes we don't want to hear, but that's what we need to do (laughs) if we want to make it happen. (laughs) Exactly. And building a business is so much about stepping outside of our comfort zone that if we just kind of stay where it's safe, it's probably not going to happen. Probably not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's, that's important to remember as well. Like I think, you know, people can really glamorize starting a business and being like, Oh, well, you know, you can set your own schedule and you can travel and it's amazing. But it, you know, there are a lot of things that aren't, you know, necessarily the funnest (laughs) things to be doing. So it's a matter of deciding, okay, well, if you want to have a business, you know, getting okay with doing those things. And You know, sometimes I've seen this, you know, a number of times people think that they want to start a business and then they may take a course, they try it and they realize it's not for them. Mm. And that's like, that's totally fine. You know, I think it's good that you get this real, the realization, the sooner the better. Yeah. Then you can, you know, get a career that really lights you up. Yeah, exactly. And stop dreaming about a business that's really not for you. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was such a pleasure to speak with you. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me, Holly. You're welcome. And thank you for listening. And remember to visit hollywharton.com forward slash 167 for the show notes on this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the Business Mindset Podcast with your host, Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode 
including links for topics that were discussed at hollywharton.com. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to head over to iTunes and leave a quick review of this podcast. It just takes a minute. Thank you.